November 2018, Megan Murphy, a radical feminist blogger, found their Twitter accounts had been permanently banned from the site. According to Twitter, Murphy broke their terms and conditions for referring to another user, a self-styled activist who considers himself to be transgender, with the incorrect pronouns, and in particular calling them a man. This is despite the activist in question using a male name not just on Twitter, but the majority of their online content. A month later, during a council meeting in Langley, Vancouver, the activist, who are referred to as JY, revealed themselves to the public and took gleeful credit for Murphy's banning. The meeting brought an end to a year filled of infamy for JY, who had raised questionable lawsuits in the name of trans rights, but also faced serious accusations against their own conduct and 2019 looks set to make them an even more controversial character in the world of trans activism. But just who is this JY? What is their story? And is this a case of a rising star? Or a fight for relevance that has been denied their whole life? Before I continue, I need to explain why I'm only referring to this individual as JY, and why images of them are blurred. As will become clear, JY has been able to weaponize their transgender identity to instill censorship on any discussion about them. As a result, the only way I can discuss this person is by the way they wanted to be known when they were able to apply for anonymity with the Canadian courts, and that's by their initials. I'll also be using gender neutral pronouns when discussing them to avoid any accusations of misgendering, as this person's identity is completely inconsistent. Not much is known about JY's early life, except they studied computer science at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in Surrey, British Columbia. JY first came into the public eye in August 2008, when they launched an internet campaign through Facebook for a Canadian National Sex Day. The aim of JY's holiday was to encourage up to a million Canadians to spend the 21st of August having sex with each other. Talking about the event, JY said, I thought a special day just for this type of activity would be the best. According to various media sources, more than 140,000 people joined the Facebook group for the proposed event. And whilst the group has since been taken down, it's been mentioned JY was promoting safe sex and even offering to send out condoms to would-be participants. Extra, a Canadian LGBT news site, helped promote JY's event in Ottawa's gay village, speaking to people on the street to get their thoughts on the proposed holiday. Are you planning to celebrate now that you've found out? I should call my boyfriend and probably see if he wants to celebrate, absolutely. Yeah. Do you think the National Sex Day should be an official holiday? Should we get time off, maybe paid vacation? It's already Pride, so I don't know if that's going to really work, but that, that'd be nice to have a day off to have sex. I would agree with that for sure. So I'm here with Shelly from Venus Envy, and apparently she didn't know that it was National Sex Day. Oops, I had no idea. What do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> I'm a very, very bad sex author apparently. Well, that's okay. No one else really knows about it anyway. <laughs> There are no records to show how many people participated in JY's sex event, but it seems likely it wasn't the success JY had hoped, as no further National Sex Days have been held. In January 2009, JY launched their first website, Trusted Nerd, a tech journal and blog where JY would review a variety of products ranging from computer hardware and software to gadgets and cars. In its current form, the site's posts only go back as far as June 2012, though older versions of the site can be accessed through the Wayback Machine. It's difficult to gauge the popularity of the site, as most, if not all, of JY's reviews don't appear to have any kind of interaction with the intended audience, and the content on the site appears to have crawled to a standstill. In 2018, JY uploaded a total of three reviews. One was for a set of wireless headphones, which was reviewed after apparent months of testing in various environments, but doesn't clarify what kind of environments these were. The review discusses the specs of the headphones, which JY gives a 4 out of 5, but doesn't give more details than what you would expect to find in a basic press release. JY's other two articles for 2018 were related to sex toys. The first, entitled Sex Toys Galore, 
mentions how the company called XR Brands provided JY with multiple sex toys, with JY commenting, you girls asked for it, you girls got it. There are currently no records to show how many women demanded JY to review sex toys. JY gives most of the products in the review high marks. On the pleasure curve flexible, JY says, this bad boy will make you come so much that you'll be screaming Donald Trump's name over and over. And on the fun to stick power wand, JY comments that my pussy got wet just looking at it. And JY has a particular soft spot for the Oh My Bod Love Life vibrator, as according to them, that is what the beautiful cam girls at myfreecams.com use. The only sex toy to not get a glowing review from JY is also the only toy geared towards men, the dual vibrating penis head teaser. Despite initially saying it is a great product for any guy that would want to get hard fast, JY scores it a 2.5 out of 5, markedly lower than any of the toys aimed at women. JY also comments that, as per popular request, another review is coming in January 2019. Whilst there's nothing to suggest JY reviewing sex toys is as popular as implied here, another sex toy review was posted a few months later, this time for a Lilo vibrator. Trusted Nerd also claims to cover news within the tech industry, but a cursory glance at the headlines posted do not appear to show any content besides the title and that it was written by JY. Finally, the site has an important notice from September 2014 in which JY claims there are multiple people impersonating Trusted Nerd, which they say hurts their image considerably. JY also confirms there is an editor for Trusted Nerd, Annette Parks, though there is little on Trusted Nerd which mentions her outside this post. It's also important to note that JY doesn't provide any examples of the apparent fake reviews. JY would follow up Trusted Nerd with other websites in the future, including a consultancy site called JY Knows It, which was set up in 2016, but the site has remained fairly inactive. The site does include a bio for JY, but despite using a male name throughout, JY is referred to with female pronouns. It also mentions JY had worked with a YouTube pop group by the name of Cimarelli a group of six sisters who were aged between 12 and 22 at the time of JY's involvement with them around 2013. JY helped out with their social media, including making an Instagram block list related to the band, in which various accounts were labelled as being fakes. JY would also respond to fans in place of the band, and appears to have reached a level of infamy within the group's fan circles. Allegations of bullying fans, some as young as 13, were put forward to JY, although there doesn't appear to be any acknowledgement. Chat logs from the website Ask.fm, which were claimed to be posted by JY, show pictures such as Do you think JY, who worked for Cimarelli, is a sexy beast? Would you hook up with him? To which a user responded, Jay, you're effing gross. You're like 30 and I'm 13. Get the F off my ask, pervert. A follow-up post claimed it was a joke, but the 13-year-old responded, No, it's gross, Jay, go away. As a defence, another post is made, clarifying JY is actually 26 at the time, and not 30. Another Cimarelli fan called Louise apparently fell victim to a group of self-proclaimed JY fans, calling themselves the J-Lovers. Louise would receive constant harassment from the supposed group, including a threat to cut off her balls by JY's apparent girlfriend, and there are multiple posts making reference to how JY's girlfriend is apparently beautiful, and some posts indicate she was 16 when JY was dating her. Later, it is implied JY and the 16-year-old had a baby together. There are also multiple posts aimed at Louise asking if various members of Cimarelli have had their periods, and whether they use pads or tampons. In 2018, Louise would document her experiences with JY in a thread on Twitter. She claims JY's position with Cimarelli was self-appointed. After she became critical of JY's involvement, a campaign of harassment was set up against her, which she believes was JY's work. She also makes serious allegations that JY was talking to and threatening Cimarelli fans under the age of 18, some of who she says JY was sending sexually explicit messages to. JY would eventually part ways with Cimarelli, but did try to launch a Cimarelli branded headphone set in 16, which ultimately failed. Cimarelli wasn't the only music act that JY would get involved with. Around 2017, JY was acting as a PR manager for a transgender singer by the name of Chelsko, who pulled out pub plans to shoot at a water park because she was told she'd be unable to use female changing rooms by the management, a claim they denied. It's unclear to the extent of JY's involvement with her. 
JY was also known to make numerous complaints and lawsuits, a trait that would come to define them after transitioning. Example of this behaviour includes a complaint to Canadian airline WestJet, demanding a full refund after a child kicks JY's seat during a flight. JY also tried to sue a theatre group after a number of actors burnt sage on set. JY said the sage burning caused injury and as a result they had difficulties breathing. The case was eventually dropped. In 2017, JY came out as being transgender and started using a female name, also beginning with J, in addition to the male name, using them intermittently depending on which profile was being used. Such behaviour is generally uncommon amongst trans people who opt to distance themselves from their dead name as much as possible. Before the transition, JY's exploits would certainly raise eyebrows to their limited audience, but things were about to go into overdrive. In May 2018, an administrator for a Facebook makeup group made a post detailing how many of their members had received unwanted messages from JY, becoming progressively more uncomfortable and intrusive as time went on. She claimed this was happening in multiple groups and wanted to warn other women of JY's behaviour. She enclosed screenshots of the conversations between JY and various members of the group in which JY would discuss using the women's changing room before bringing up tampons, pads and underage girls. The original poster also claims JY asked for women to send over specific photos of themselves and would receive explicit pictures from JY. In one of the screenshots, JY curiously discusses potentially seeing naked girls in the changing rooms, saying, If there's like 30 girls in the change room, how many of them would you say are out there changing freely with their vaginas and tits out? Another message reads, Is it possible I will notice a girl with a tampon string hanging out? And a similar message, in which JY asks a woman if she's ever seen a tampon string hanging out of a girl's vagina, was sent to someone else. JY also brings up how they have a penis and doesn't wish to change in front of people if they might make JY feel uncomfortable. One such message says, like, even though I have a dick unfortunately, I can be fully out there and change with them. Like, I don't want them to give me any issues or things. JY later claims to have been born with both reproductive organs. In another message, JY claims to have periods, saying, I think my period is going to start on Wednesday when I'm travelling to Victoria and going on the ferry. Every single time I take that ferry to the island, there's field trips with 10 to 12 year old girls on it, each and every time. If I'm in the bathroom and a girl asks me for a pad or tampon and potentially help on how to use it, if it's her first period, what do I do? JY asked another member the following, if she wants a tampon though, should I give her one and instruct her on how to use it? And what would I tell her? Like, would I go into the stall with her and help her? JY then appears to make a strangely self-aware observation on how weird it all sounds. JY also discusses wanting to use tampons, saying, I really, really want to use a tampon. I have tons. Pads feel so weird, especially during the summer when it gets hot. Later on, JY messages another woman after using the women's changing rooms, sounding disappointed with their experience. The message reads, Went really well. I expected more though. I only saw one girl in her panties. I was really expecting to walk in and see girls with their boobs out. It's unclear how many women received messages from JY, but a lot of women have come forward to claim they also received messages similar to the ones previously mentioned, and others commented on the absurdity of what JY was asking particularly on young girls asking for advice with tampons. JY would later deny the messages were sent by them. In a conversation with the Twitter user, the first one, JY says, anyone can take a picture, create a fake account and post those messages. Happens to me every few months. It's part of being high profile. In the summer of 2018, JY would finally enter the mainstream, but not from their own choosing. Late in August, parts of the press reported on what they considered to be a serious breach of human rights after an unnamed trans woman filed a complaint with Canada's Human Rights Tribunal after being refused a bikini wax. The individual involved was granted anonymity by the court and would only be referred to by their initials. You don't need me to point out what they were. The saga that would come to define JY in the public eye began in March 2018. JY, despite having male genitals, felt they needed a Brazilian wax and set off messaging various aestheticians in the Vancouver area inquiring about a waxing. 
After being offered the service, JY would then reveal the waxing would be done on their penis and testicles, at which point the service would be inevitably withdrawn. In one exchange with aesthetician Sheila Poyer on Facebook, JY was told she doesn't wax men. JY messaged her multiple times wanting her attention, and when she finally responded, she asked if they were now female, to which JY replied yes. She then agrees to carry out the waxing, but JY then says, I still have my male genitalia though, is that okay? I haven't had surgery. The aesthetician replies no, to which JY challenged him saying, why is that not okay? I'm a female. In total, JY approached 18 salons between March and April 2018 about the bikini wax, but only three accepted to carry it out. It's unclear whether JY received any waxing, although one would assume you wouldn't need to be waxed three times in such a short space of time. As for the 15 salons which refused, JY accused them of breaching their human rights and filed complaints against each, demanding $2,500 and an apology. JY's case has mirrored a similar incident which took place at a salon in Windsor, Ontario, where a transgender woman was denied having their male genitals waxed by a Muslim aesthetician. This case was also taken to a human rights tribunal where $50,000 was demanded. It's unclear whether these cases are related, although the similarities are stark. Speaking to the Calgary Sun, a local paper, JY discussed their upset at not having their genitals waxed, saying, that really got to me. I shouldn't have to do this amount of work to get a leg wax or a Brazilian wax. I shouldn't have to scour to find a salon where to do what is customarily available to the public. It hurts. If everywhere I go, I get shut down for who I am. JY also filed an additional complaint against the boyfriend of Sheila Poyer, Jeremy Paradis, accusing him of harassment. However, text messages provided to the tribunal showed Paradis accused JY of being the harasser. In one message, Paradis told JY, please stop harassing my girlfriend or we will take further action. She explained to you what she does and does not do. Do not call her work again and don't bother messaging me back. Get a life when someone says no. Move on. JY would respond saying that all they were doing was inquiring. Paradis would then accuse JY of further harassment and questioned why JY was still using a male name when they said they transitioned. Poya would go on to challenge JY's use of anonymity, citing JY's online presence as a reason for doing so. And as a result, JY dropped the case, claiming their Facebook profile had been hacked but other 14 cases remained open. Due to the controversy, JY's identity soon leaked to the public. And with it, so did the knowledge of their websites, their previous antics, and most importantly, the Facebook messages JY would send about women's changing rooms. Condemnation towards JY for their actions was swift and harsh, but then something happened nobody had predicted. Twitter users were finding themselves suspended and in some cases permanently banned for referring to JY with male pronouns, despite JY almost exclusively using their male name at this time. It turned out JY was taking advantage of Twitter's hateful conduct policy, which means the misgendering of a trans person, intentional or otherwise, is seen as harassment. JY took full advantage of this and so began a campaign of removing their critics from the site, which continues to this day, the most high profile of which was Megan Murphy. Even in recent weeks before recording, accounts such as Liberal Not Lefty face suspensions simply for discussing JY. Similarly, YouTube videos on JY have been removed from the site, and the ones that remain don't always mention JY by their full name, mostly using initials as I'm doing here. As a result, this has all but strangled any discussion on this individual on the internet's largest platforms and is a level of censorship unprecedented on social media. So let's discuss exactly who JY is. I want to go back to a telling comment JY made that I mentioned earlier. When accused of sending grossly inappropriate messages on Facebook, JY claimed the profile was fake and not them, saying it's part of being high profile. Now it's true that JY is getting more name recognition than ever before. But does that mean JY is a big name in the LGBT community? Typing JY's names, male or female, into Google is a big tell of their infamy. One would expect searching for a high profile activist would bring up their own websites or links they have with larger organizations or projects. But the very top entry isn't even JY's own Twitter page. This comes below a scathing article written by Miranda Yardley titled JY is a sex predator, in which Yardley discusses JY's Facebook messages and bathroom usage amongst their other controversies. And the other entries when searching for JY aren't any more positive. A link to a thread on Kiwi Farms, news articles on JY's testicle wax and court cases, and a whole website claiming JY is a sexual predator and pedophile are amongst the links on the first page. 
JY's Twitter and YouTube pages are the only positive links that show up, and there's a distinct lack of news coverage not connected with JY's self-inflicted controversies. There are plenty of articles discussed in the waxing episode on Mega Murphy's banning on Twitter, but there are no stories on what JY actually does for the LGBT community in any capacity. Any sympathetic coverage simply discusses how JY was apparently misgendered by Murphy, and don't apply any criticism or skepticism of their claims. But an even bigger tell of JY's own popularity is their presence on social media, and in particular, Twitter. JY's current follower count is more than 145,000, which sounds impressive at first glance, except there is very little interaction with their tweets. Few are liked or retweeted, and most of the responses are simply links to other sites critical of JY. And one of the only supportive responses was from an obvious troll, which JY unironically thanked for their support. But in July of 2018, something very interesting happened. Back then, JY's follower count was more than double what it is today, sitting at over 300,000. However, on 25th of July, the number dropped quite dramatically out of the blue. I wouldn't see any real growth again until towards the end of October when they gained almost 50,000 followers for no obvious reason. Not long afterwards, all these followers, and a few more, would also disappear. And all of this was happening before JY's name hit the level of infamy which they now enjoy. But maybe JY was popular because of their website Trusted Nerd. After all, JY lists it as one of their crowning achievements. But as I mentioned earlier, this site has very little in the way of substance. In fact, the site's traffic is so low, it's impossible to get any real data, with Alexa.com outright stating there's not enough traffic data. There's also little sign of any interaction with any visitors. There are no options to leave comments, and searching for Trusted Nerd through Google only brings up sites critical of JY. The webpage's Facebook group is fairly inactive also. If the site was as popular and well-known as JY wants us to believe, we would expect there to be more coverage than accusations of pedophilia. And even in the early days, JY had a self-inflated image of themselves. Between 2008 and 2014, JY attempted to create a Wikipedia page three times based on themselves. In the first attempt, they claimed many other people were just as important and had their own pages, so therefore JY's should remain. A final attempt in September 2014 was struck down by a wiki moderator who commented, this guy seems to be creating his own page every time it gets deleted. His social media followers seem to be purchased and the Alexa ranking on his website indicates very little traffic at all. Looks like his online presence exists largely to obtain demo products from tech companies. The idea that JY is a high profile individual outside of the controversies they've caused by themselves doesn't hold much water. So is JY's story that of someone who has fought for their place in the spotlight only to fail at every attempt and have to resort to underhanded tactics just to inflate their importance? This is certainly a part of who JY is and it's been consistent throughout their known life. But this fails to answer the elephant in the room. After all, JY certainly has fame now, albeit for the wrong reasons. But what's fame if nobody can talk about you, right? Being well known isn't enough. JY doesn't want any criticism, however much it is warranted, and believe me, it most certainly is. From a habit of filing legal cases to the smallest of grievances, many in circumstances they've made themselves, JY is certainly a fan of throwing their weight around in an attempt to get their way. Although this has never had much success, that is, until JY transitions. The current narrative from the trans community is that everyone who says they are trans is automatically valid. There's no need to change anything about you when transitioning. You can use a male name, present in a male way, and not have any medical procedures, and yet still insist you are a woman because you want to be referred to as she. And that's exactly what JY has done, leaving their male name on websites like Twitter, then using the trans card when someone refers to a person with a male name as a man in order to get them removed. And not to forget requesting a female aesthetician wax a male body because that person now self-identifies as female despite using a male name in the request. One would be forgiven for thinking, we now live in clown world, where such a thing could be laughed off as a joke. But the sad reality is that such a thing now warrants a human rights complaint against an innocent woman, with the gay media cheering on the proud non-transitioning trans woman as though their case is a just cause and not a quick cash grab. And as expected, there is little condemnation from the so-called trans community. Morgane Auger, another controversial trans activist, defended JY's use of both male and female names by saying, transitioning can be a complex time. 
Auger has also been highly skeptical of the claims made against JY, and other activists have been openly supportive of JY against the accusations of pedophilia without question. The trans community wants an open border on being trans, whilst at the same time denying anyone can take advantage of self-identifying as a woman. JY, who has faced serious accusations about what they want to see and do in women's changing rooms, is able to use their trans identity to silence anyone critical, and the big tech companies have their back as they don't want to look transphobic in current year. If you don't believe JY is taking advantage of self-ID, ask yourself this. Could you imagine big tech protecting criticism of a cisgender man who sent women messages asking about whether they should take a young girl into a toilet cubicle and show her how to use a tampon? That's the protection the trans identity has allowed JY to have. A rotten example of how self-ID can allow a disingenuous, fame-hungry pervert to go unchallenged. So what's next for JY? Well, they've entered to compete for Miss BC, asking their local council for $10,000 as a charity donation without disclosing how much of that goes to the cause and how much goes on meals and other luxuries. They've also been nominated for Woman of the Year, despite 2018 being anything but inspiring. And JY has also found themselves involved with an unnamed youth charity. 2019 is sure to be an interesting year, but one thing seems certain the controversies, the hunger for attention, and the abuse of censorship will only continue.